What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. You're continuing the reading of The Ethics of Money Production, the phenomenal book by Dr. Jörg Guido Hulzmann and published by the Mises Institute. Today, in part one, chapter four, the utilitarian consideration on the production of money. Part one, the sufficiency of natural money production. So far, we have described how a commodity money system would work in a free market and how this system appears from an ethical point of view. We've also argued that our present paper currencies and electronic currencies could not survive in a truly free market against the competition of commodity monies. They continue to be used because they enjoy the privilege of special legal protection against their natural competitors, gold and silver. At no time in history has paper money been produced in a competitive market setting. Whenever and wherever it came into being, it exists only because the courts and the police suppress the natural alternatives. In other words, we have a paper money to have a paper money means to allow the government to significantly curtail the personal liberties of its citizens. It means to curtail the freedom of association and the freedom of contract in a way that affects the citizens on a daily basis and on a massive scale. It means to send in the police and to use the courts to combat human cooperation involving natural monies such as gold and silver. Monies in use since biblical times. These circumstances weigh heavily against paper money and using the armed forces of the state to put an entire nation before the stark choice of either using the government's money or renouncing the benefit of monetary exchange altogether. This is certainly not a light matter, but one, to, one that requires a compelling and unassailable rational. To make a moral case for paper money or electronic monies, on one has to demonstrate that they convey significant advantages to the community of their users, the nation. Advantages that might compensate for their severe moral shortcomings. The question then is whether such an advantage exists. Can paper money and electronic money be justified on utilitarian grounds? To this question, we now turn. It is a significant fact that before the time when paper money was first, first came into being, no philosopher of money ever criticized the then existing commodity monies on utilitarian grounds. It is true that Plato proposed to outlaw private ownership of natural monies, gold and silver, on political grounds, namely to ensure that each individual was economically dependent on the government. See Plato's The Law. He argues that the money must be suitable for his totalitarian ideal city, would be fiat money that has no value outside of the city walls. But even Plato did not claim that gold and silver were somewhat inadequate as monies or that the monies imposed by the government could re render greater monetary services. And neither do we find any such thought in Aristotle or the writings of the Church Father or the Scholastics. Quite to the contrary, Bishop Nicholas Oresmi argued that the money supply was irrelevant to monetary exchange per se. Changes of the nominal money supply, the alteration of names, did not make money more suitable to be used in indirect exchange, nor less. Such changes merely affect the terms of deferred payment, the credit contracts, which was also why Erasmi opposed them. See Erasmi's uh, treatise on the origin, nature, law, and alternatives of money. Thus, before the 16th century, there was apparently no problem of hoarding or of sticky prices, and apparently no need to stabilize the price level, the purchasing power, or aggregate demand. But the champions of paper money are far from seeing any significance in this fact. Gold and silver, they argue, were sufficient for the primitive economics e economies prevailing until the high Middle Ages. But the capitalist economies that emerged in the Renaissance required a different type of money. And the new theories explaining this need arose along with the new paper currencies. So what do we make of these new theories? We have to examine them one by one, even though in the present work we can only address the major ones, trusting that the reader will rely on everything else on other works.
But before we explain the fallacies involved in the most widespread justification of paper money, let us point out that post-1500, monetary writings not only swamped the world with such justifications, but also provided the, rejoined, the rejoinders. We have already mentioned that Eresmi argues that the money supply was irrelevant in the sense that the services derived from monetary exchange did not depend on the quantity of money used. The intellectuals of the Renaissance and of the mercantilist period could never quite get around this fundamental insight. Even those who otherwise justified various inflationist schemes had to acknowledge it. John Locke famously argued that in a closed economy, any quantity of money would serve to derive any proportion of trade. Some consideration of the consequences of the lowering of interest and raising the value of money. The, and that was by Kelly in Locke on Money. The caveat was on the money supply had to be constant. Less money would not be an unalterable measure to the value of things. We will discuss this problem below. Then the classical, the classical economists stated very clearly that in principle, any quantity of money would do, even though they qualified this position on the light of various false doctrines they had inherited from the mercantilist processors. David Ricardo emulated Locke's argument set about the consequences of an increase in the number of transactions. Quote, there will be more commodities bought and sold, but at a lower price, so that the same money will still be adequate to the increased number of transactions by passing in each transaction at a higher value. The problem was, in Ricardo's opinion, that the increased purchasing power of money would invite additional money production. And thus, the standard of value would be modified. Moreover, this change would affect deferred payments, and that's David Ricardo in his chapter Proposals for an Economical and Secure Currency in Works and Correspondence. The first economist who will ever clear scientific grasp of this issue was John Wetley, the brilliant critic of the monetary thought of Hume, Stewart, and Smith. See John Whitley, The Theory of Money and Principle of Commerce. On Whitley, see Tom Humphrey's John Whitley's Theory of International Money. The Federal Reserve of Richmond e Economy Quarterly. Whitley's treatise is still referred today in Paul Lassage's at Columbia Encyclopedia uh, Britannia. Mm -hmm. But Wheatley never presented a systematic doctrine in print. In the 20th century, Ludwig van Mises and Murray Rothbard filled this gap. The practical offshoot of this monetary analysis is that no social benefit can be derived from government control of the money supply. In Rothbard's writing, we conclude, therefore, that deterring the supply of money, like all other goods, is best left to the free market. Aside from the general moral and economic advantages of freedom over coercion, no dictated quantity of money will do work better, and the free market will set the production of gold in accordance with its relative ability to satisfy the need of consumers, as compared with all other product, uh, production goods. And this is Murray Rothbard in What Has Government Done to Our Money? By the way, a reading of this book also available on the World Crypto Network. Again, as we have pointed out, this is anything but a novelty. In the history of thought, Oresme clearly saw the, that the increase of the nominal money supply would enrich the princess at the expense of the community, but expect for a very uh, rare and especially emergent situation, this was not the price to be paid for some benefit that could not otherwise be obtained. Nominal increase of the money supply were unnecessary from the point of view of the entire com Commonwealth. The national alterations of coinage, said Eresmi, and I quote, does not avoid a scandal, but begets it. And it many acknowledged consequences, some of which have already been mentioned, while others will appear later. Nor is there any necessity or convenience in doing it, nor can it advantageous the commonwealth. 
The truth is often deceptively simple. It is the errors that are manifold and complicated. So that it is, and at any rate, in the case of money, the simple truth is that the three is not need for political intervention to impose monies different from the one that the market participants would have chosen anyway. But many doctrines have been concocted to justify precisely such intervention. For an overview of the most widely accepted present-day criticism of natural money, see James Kimball, The Gold Standard in Contemporary Economic Principle Textbooks, a survey. It is not necessary for us to refute all of them in the present work. It was in what follows, we only discuss uh, the seven most widespread errors. Economic growth and the money supply. The most widespread monetary fallacy is probably the naive belief that economic growth is possible only to the extent that it is accompanied by the corresponding growth of the money supply. Often, this belief is based on the assignment theory of money, according to which each unit of money in some sort of a receipt. The receipt testifies that its owner has delivered a quantity of good or service into the economy as into a larger social warehouse. And by the same token, the receipt assigns the owner the right to withdraw an equivalent quantity of goods or services from the economy as form of social warehouse. This assignment theory goes back to John Law in the early 18th century, was developed in the second half of the 19th century, and eventually inspired several champions of inflation, such as Weiser and Schumpeter. Among Catholic authors subscribing to this doctrine, see in particular Heinrich Pesch, Lehrbuch der Nationalökonomie, uh, or, um, well, uh, textbook on the national economy, where the authors discuss the factors determining the money supply needed in the economy, highlighting the total value of goods and services circulating in the economy. Pesch overlooked that the market value of goods and services is not identical to the money supply. For example, a larger money supply, higher prices, and thus a higher total value of goods and services. See also Etienne Parot, Le Churintin et Longot, where the author defines the natural money as being an IOU, redeemable on demand. For a critique on this assignment theory of money, see Jean-Baptiste Sess here in Treaty de Economie Politique, uh, written in, 19, in 1841. Old fallacies die hard. Suppose the economy, the economy grows at an annual rate of 5%. Then according to this fallacy, it is necessary to increase the money supply also by 5% because otherwise the additional goods and services could not be sold. The champions of this fallacy then point out that such growth rates of the money supply are rather exceptional for precious metals. Gold and silver are therefore unsuitable to serve as the money of a dynamic modern economy. We'd better replace them with paper money, which can be flexibly increased at extremely low costs to accommodate any growth rates of the economy. This argument goes wrong because any quantity of goods and services can be exchanged with virtually any money supply. Suppose the money supply of our example does not change. If 5% more goods and services are offered on the market, then all that happens is that the money, pr money price of these goods and services will decrease. The same mechanism would allow economic growth even when the quantity of money shrinks. At any rate of growth can therefore be accommodated by virtually any supply of natural monies, such as gold and silver. The qualification virtually takes account uh, that of the fact that there are certain technolo technological limitations on the use of the precious metals. Suppose there are high growth rates over an extended period of time. In this case, it might be necessary to reduce coin size to such an extent that producing and using the coin becomes unpractical. This problem is very rare in the case of gold. It has never excited, existed in the case of silver, which is also why many informed writers consider silver to be the money per excellence. In any case, such technological problems pose no problem. As Bishop Aresmi explained more than 700 years ago, the thing to do in such a case is simply to abandon the use of unpractical coins, say gold coins, and switch to another precious metal, say silver. See Aresmi in his treaties.
And we may add, on the free market, there are strong incentives to bring about such switching promptly and efficiently. No political intervention is necessary to support this process. A more sophisticated variant of the growth requires more money doctrine grants that any quality of goods and services would be treated as virtually any more money supply. Uh, but these advocates argue that if entrepreneurs are forced to sell their products at a lower price, these prices might be too low uh, in comparison to the cost expenditure. Uh, selling product in inventories at bargain prices entails bankruptcy for the entrepreneurs. But this variancy is equivalent uh, to equally untenable because it is premised on the mechan mechanics in, on a, mechanist, a mechanistic image of entrepreneurship. The fact is that entrepreneurs can anticipate any future reduction of the selling prices of the products. In the light of such a anti anticipate in such anticipations, they can cut offering prices on their own cost expenditure and thus thrive in times of declining prices. This is also a mere theoretical possibility, but the normal state of affairs in periods of a stable or falling price levels. For example, in the late three decades of the 19th century, both Germany and the U.S. experienced high growth rates at stable and declining consumer price levels. See Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's A Monetary History of the United States and Die große Deflation, Goldstandard, Geldmenge und Preise in der USA und Deutschland, which would be The Big Deflation, The Gold Standard, Money Supply and Prices in the USA and Germany by Eckhart Schrammer. The same thing also observes more recently in the market for computers and information technology, the most vibrant market since the 1980s, which has combined a rapid growth with constantly falling, price, uh, falling product prices. Part three on hoarding. The foregoing consideration also apply to the phenomenon of hoarding. It is impossible to use money without holding a certain amount of it. Thus, every participant in a money economy hoards money. The reason why a pe pejorative term hoarding is sometimes used in lieu of more natural holding is that in the mind of the commentator, the amounts of money held by that one person is excessive. The crucial question of the course is, but by which standard? It is possible to give, it is impossible, sorry, it is possible to give a meaningful definition on hoarding in moral terms. Some people have a neurotic propensity to keep their wealth in cash. Uh, they are misers who hoard the money even when spending it would be in their personal interest. They neglect clothing, housing, education, charity, and so on. And thus, they deprive themselves of their full human potential and in turn deprive others of the benefit that comes from social bond in the developed human being. Notice that this definition of hoarding as pathological behavior does not refer to absolute amounts of money held. Rather, it concerns the amounts of money held in relative to alternative ways of investing one's wealth. There are indeed many situations in which it is advisable, both for an individual person and for groups, to hold large sums of cash. For centuries, holding large num numbers of gold and silver coins was an important way of people to save their own private pension funds. And in many times and places, it was the only way to provide for old age and emergency situations. Similarly, in times of stock market and real estate booms, it is generally prudent to keep a large amount of one's wealth in cash. In, it is true that there are other situations in which even small sums of money held might be excessive. The point is that the question whether one's cash balance uh, are just money held or whether they are pathologically money hoarded must be determined for each individual case. The right way to deal with excessive money hoarding is to talk to the person in question and persuade them to change their behavior. What if these persons remain stubborn? Is it advisable to apply political means such as expropriation or an artificial increase of the money supply? The answer to this question is, of course, in the negative. Hoarding per se might be pathological, but it does not deprive other people of what is rightfully theirs. And in particular, it does not prevent the efficiency operation of the economy. No one is being stolen from. As we have stated above, the absolute money supply of an economy is virtually irrelevant 
the economy can work and work well with virtually any quantity of money. Hoarding merely entails a reduction of money prices. Hoarding on mass scale merely entails large reduction of money prices. Consider the completely unrealistic scenario of a nation hoarding so much silver that the remaining silver would be the, combine, the, the coined in microscopically small quantities to be used in the exchange. This is probably close to a scenario that most critics of hoarding have in mind. Thus, we read in the influenced contemporary books on ca Catholic social doctrine, in early literature, a common symbol of the economic evil was the miser who, th who threw aversy hoarding of his money. And the miser was evil because it, in a static world with valuable in short supply, what one person hoarded was subtracted from the common store. That was Michael Novak in the spirit of democratic capitalism. The author then goes on to point out that the social problem of hoarding has been resolved in modern times through the beliefs in the uh, din, 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 dynamism of capitalism, which incend, incites people to spend rather than hoard their money. We will have occasions to deal with the dy dynamism in some more details below. At this point, let us notice that hoarding is never, per se, a social problem in the first place. In a free society, the market participants would then simply switch to other monies. Rather than paying with silver coins, they would start using gold coins and copper coins. Now suppose that despite the foregoing considerations, a government bent on fighting money hoardings would set on the artificially increase the money supply anyway. Would this policy reach its goal? Not necessarily. There is at least an equal likelihood that the policy would actually promote hoarding. The increased money supply would raise the money prices paid on the market above, the level that would otherwise have reached. And this makes it necessary for people to hold larger cash balances. Now, it is true that the increase in individual cash balances is not necessarily in strict proportion to the increase of the price level. Thus, it is possible that people will, relatively speaking, reduce their demand for money, for money as a consequence of policy. But uh, the, it is just as likely that the policy will even no such effect. The policy will have no such effect or that it actually produces the opposite effect. Thus, we conclude that hoarding cannot serve as a uh, pretext for the artificial extension of the money supply. In some extreme cases, it might merit the attention of spiritual leaders and psychologists, but it, it is never a monetary problem. Piers, thank you very much here for joining me in chapter four for the utilitarian considerations on the production of money. And here, the first three parts of the sufficiency of natural money production, economic growth, and the money supply, and hoarding. Thank you very much for Dr. Kido Hiltzman for writing this outstanding work and for the Mises Institute for publishing it. Piers, see you on the next show. Bye-bye.